Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Julie Hyman. Let's get you up to speed on the market action. We've got one hour left to go in the trading day. It is right across the board, although the Dow pretty flat right now. The uh, S&P 500 down 25. The Nasdaq down uh, more than a percent right now. Tech names certainly dragging the broader market lower with Oracle, the worst performer on the S&P 500, continuing that slide on the back of its results. Moving in the opposite direction, we've got energy, the best performing sector today. U.S. crude prices touching the highest level since November of last year, with OPEC maintaining that forecast for robust oil demand going into next year. Uh, we have seen Treasury yields, though, trading pretty flat on the back of the continued concerns around where inflation is headed. But of course, Julie, the big story of this hour is Apple. Yes, indeed it is. Our top story this hour is indeed Apple unveiling its next generation iPhones and watch. And as expected, the tech giant is replacing its lightning chargers with USB-Cs. Yahoo Finance's Josh Lipton is here now. So give us the, I mean, there weren't any big surprises in here. They, as usual, we got most of the stuff in dribs and drabs and leaks. A lot of dust seem to up. leak now. I know. Yeah, There's a lot what, of rumors, like, a lot of reports. What's most important? What, what do we it? need so to So know? This, is, this is Apple's big show. Tim Cook takes the stage, makes a lot of, a lot of new announcements. Let's run through the highlights. I'm going to start, of course, with the iPhone. Apple introducing four new models. The base iPhone 15 will cost $799. The larger iPhone 10 Plus will cost $899. Also, two new high-end Pro models as well. So that's going to feature new titanium design, faster processor and camera upgrades. Apple billing this as the most powerful Pro lineup yet. iPhone Pro starts at $999 and the iPhone Pro Max starts at $1,199. Now, if you are ready to upgrade, pre-orders Apple saying it starts this Friday. And yes, as expected, Apple confirming that USB-C ports are coming to iPhone. That, of course, in response to new EU regulations. Also, new wearables were introduced at the show today. A new high-end Apple Watch Ultra 2 priced at $7.99. That comes with Apple's brightest display ever, a company says. A powerful new chip and 36 hours of battery life with regular use. And a new double tap feature that lets users control the watch with just one hand. Meanwhile, the Series 9 is going to be priced at $3.99 and the watch SE starts at $2.49. Wearables, as we know, important for Apple. Analysts estimate the watch now does account for about 5% of total revenue. Same with AirPods, an estimated 5%. And Apple did introduce new AirPods Pro today as well, second generation for 249. So these are real and meaningful business lines now for Tim Cook's company. Okay, really interesting here, some of these upgrades. Maybe I'll finally get rid of my 11. I don't know. Oh, yeah, they're waiting for you, Julia, to do that. They're waiting for Make me. the move. It still works, though. <laughs> it works fine. Um, the interesting thing is not really seeing a lot of change in price. I think there's a $100 increase at the top of the mm -hmm. top, the Max Pro but otherwise not seeing a change in price. What's, what's yes. up with that? Well, so off iPhone, uh, you're right, the new iPhone Pro 99, the iPhone Pro Max 1,199, and that is interesting. I think that'll be interesting to see how consumers react to that. You know, is that a ceiling that people say, you know what, I am not willing to make that move. I'm facing, hey, listen, we talk on Yahoo Finance all the time, some of these kind of storm clouds facing the consumer. They got a lot going on right now with rising energy prices and higher borrowing costs. So is that a ceiling? Or do people feel like, you know what, this device, Julie, I text, I message, I got payments, I got music, I got health information. I know I'm going to keep it on average now for three and a half years. That's the average corner analyst. So maybe they are willing to stretch for that higher price point. We'll see. Well, and everybody now pays over that three and a half years, right? The vast exactly. majority of people right. now buying these phones are not paying that $9.99 or whatever it is up front. They're paying it over. The that that would be the, the bull case. That this new price point for the very high end, people would say, you know what? Over three and a half years, people would feel like I can spread that out a little bit. I can stretch. We'll see. We will see. Thanks, yeah. Josh. Well, as Julie mentioned, Apple unveiling a slate of new products today, including the iPhone 15 and 15 Pro at its annual event in Cupertino. The most notable changes in the phones, the switch to a USB-C port and improved cameras. Apple also unveiled two new watches, the Series 9 and the Ultra 2. The stock, though, trading lower, down about 2% in reaction. The announcements come after three consecutive quarters of declining sales for Apple and an overall slowdown in the smartphone market. So... 
How will the new products impact the company's bottom line? Here with more from Apple headquarters, we've got Ray Wong, Constellation Research Principal Analyst and Founder, as well as Bob O'Donnell, Technologist Research President and Chief Analyst. I'm kind of imagining you guys on opposite sides of the campus right now. You are <laughs> technically in the same location. <laughs> we probably are. But, <laughs> but, yeah, we're not uh, that Ray far away. I could probably see Ray, you know, um, you know, looking <laughs> down from where I am up here, but. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of people there. Um, Ray, let me start with you though, because we we did see yeah, yeah. Apple shares uh, reach you know session lows on the back of this announcement. Is this a situation where we've got sort of sell the news, or is it about the price point? I mean, what's your reaction to what was announced today? It's actually neither. What's actually happening is we still have the China overhang, really the concern about the China market, which was a growing market uh, and not actually necessarily a market that is now, it's a market that we're worried about and there's a risk factor there. And it's also the fact that India market also is not able to get their semiconductor chips and manufacturing up fast enough. But the good news is there's still demand. We are in a super cycle. There's about 250 to 300 million iPhones that need to get the 5G. There are folks that are about to enter the holiday season that are looking for something to give and the safety features are definitely one of the items on the iPhone 15 and also the ultra watch actually brings in uh, some of the things that people have been looking for in terms of brighter displays and of course the ability to actually integrate more of your technologies with your personal health and of course your quantified self. Um, Bob you know we all see these things through our own lens right and as I was just talking about a moment ago I got an iPhone 11 uh, sure I'd love a shiny new iPhone but it works it still works. Yep. It's I keep buying more memory, so, you know, so I'm still paying into to the Apple services machine. But so I guess what I'm asking is, are these incremental changes today enough to convert the people who don't need a new phone? No, it's not going to convert people who don't need a new phone, I don't think. I mean, it's nice incremental changes. You know, Ray laid, Ray laid out some things that I think are valid and important in terms of the China market. But for and for and folks in that market are going to look at this and think, oh, I think there's some nice things there. Uh, it is interesting, by the way, that they highlighted some Chinese gaming companies in their presentation, clearly um, wanting to make sure that they make that point. But as far as regular folks in the U.S., I think people are going to see, hey, if I do have a, an iPhone 11 like you, it might be time anyway. It's not necessarily because of what's on the 15 that's going to do it. Um, I do think the roadside assistance was actually a pleasant surprise in terms of a new feature, a satellite-based feature that I think people will actually appreciate. And Apple does a bunch of these kind of nice little things that make you say, well, you know, Maybe not that one particular feature, but if I think about it collectively, and oh, by the way, if I look at the performance and capabilities versus my iPhone 11, it's much better. And so eventually people say, you know what, it is time. And since the prices didn't change, which a lot of people expected them to change a lot more than they did, I think people now are going to be a little bit more comfortable. That may be a little bit also why the streets reacting, because rumors were that the prices were going to be higher, which theoretically theoretically will lead to better profits. So that could be part of that uh, downward spike in the in the price after the announcements. Uh, so, so Ray, let's pick up on that point um, because Bob, I think, makes an interesting case. You know, the expectation was that there would be higher prices. You would need to sell fewer units, but able to, to, to bring in more of the revenue. And yet, Bob, it sounds like you're arguing that, look, even at a lower price point, maybe that gives more incentive for users to sort of upgrade at a time when they are still strapped for cash. I mean, Ray, how do you look at that price point, $100 more when you look at the top end of the line? And is that enough of a catalyst, at least for the stock, just given that the iPhone 15 isn't, at least right now, expected to, to, to go gangbusters, partly because of the macro conditions we're looking at right now? You got to agree with Bob's assumptions. I think the lower price point in this economy is going to actually drive demand. People are going to say, hey, it's about the same price, but I need two more features, right? The roadside assistance is definitely something I think about with kids, right? Something I think about when you're uh, traveling. And I think that's, you know, that's an example of that uh, capability of bringing hardware services and experiences together. Um, I think the bigger issue is really is not this. It's if you can expand the base, move them to 5G, there are more services to sell. And this is, of course, the device is just the beginning. The services is really about what everything is about, uh, of getting the average revenue per user much higher. And what we've seen is a consistent growth on the services side. Even if these sales go down, people are still using the services. That's the hedge. And that's the base case you have to make for the Apple stock, which is why a $200 buy rating is not out of 
the question. The question is really, what's the China demand and the overhang? That's the one I'm most worried about. Um, Bob, how worried are you about the, the China issue here, which is still, you know, right, it's still reports, it's still not concrete. The concern is not so much specifically government workers, for example, it's that there would be sort of a bigger stigma, cultural stigma attached to the iPhone. Is there even any way of gaming that out at this point? I don't know that there really is. It's so hard to say, Julie, but, you know, if it stretches down into, you know, government controlled companies, of course, of which there are many, that becomes a factor. I think Chinese consumers have made it clear, however, that they really like the iPhone and they like the whole ecosystem. To Ray's point, I mean, people buy into the ecosystem. And once you've done that, it's really hard to pull out. So I think it's going to be a real challenge in any market, you know, in China as well as the U.S. That's why Apple tends to do very well. And, and keeping the price points, as you talked about, uh, where they were in a time when the smartphone market is down, Demand has been lower. You know, if they raise the prices, I think that would not have worked for those mainstream phones. And on the higher end, those are the people that are less price sensitive anyway, so it doesn't matter that much. And you can make the argument, as Apple did, that, hey, for 256 gigabyte iPhones last year, that's what we charged as well. So it wasn't much of a price change, and I don't think that's going to do too many things. And, you know, that question around China is the big one, but it's really hard to say how it's going to impact things over time. And Bob, what about those concerns about this Huawei Mate 60 phone that has come out and whether in fact that eats into the market share for Apple? You could argue Apple benefited on the back of those export controls against Huawei back in 2019. We've heard about the phone being sold out in China. Yes, we're still talking about a seven nanometer chip, but do you think that's a bigger concern than these reported bans that so far, at least according to reports, have been really limited to government employees? Yeah, I am not worried about the Huawei issue because for a number of reasons. First of all, some of the technology that they're using, they've had, and it's for the people who know the semiconductor industry well, they know it was possible for Huawei to do this. But what isn't clear at all is whether or not Huawei can do this in quantity. We see this a lot in tech. There are companies who can build an amazing product. They can build a couple of them. To build things like that in quantity is significantly harder. And I am not convinced that Huawei is going to have the capabilities to do that. And, oh, by the way, this is seven nanometer apples at three. You know, and they're going to keep losing that battle moving forward. So I don't. I think the Huawei thing is a little bit of a, a red herring. It's and flag waving to a certain degree to try and say, oh no, we're just fine. When in fact, I think they are challenged, and they just managed to get out a couple of chips to power a couple of these phones. And oh, by the way, it's still not even clear that they're actually fully supporting 5G. So uh, again, lots of questions on the Huawei thing that I don't think will be a factor for Apple. And Ray, I'm curious if you have the same take. <laughs> it's a little smoke and mirrors going on there with Huawei. Uh, I think the most important piece is Apple is a luxury brand. Huawei is not. We're talking about di different stratifications in the marketplace. And what Bob is saying is absolutely true, right? We're not sure what's delivered and why it was sold out and how many units is sold out. I think that's the important question to ask. Is it going to impact Apple? Yeah, maybe two or three percentage points in market share. But if you're just looking for a high-end phone luxury device that you can associate a brand to, that's not going to be Huawei. Guys, thanks so much. Great to catch up with you from outside of the event itself, Ray Wong and Bob <laughs> O'Donnell. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the court battle between the Justice Department and Google is kicking off today. We're breaking down what the antitrust trial could mean for the tech giant. That's on the other side. Plus, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy endorsing an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. What that means for the threat of a government shutdown later this hour. Plus, tens of thousands of people descending on San Francisco for Dreamforce 2023. It's hosted by tech giant Salesforce. And Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, is on the ground speaking with some big names, including the CEO of Salesforce, Mark Benioff. Stay tuned for those interviews tomorrow and Thursday. You don't want to miss it.
morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Let's do a check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. We are seeing red across the board right now with about 45 minutes left to go in the trading day. The Dow down 46, the S&P 500 down 28, and the NASDAQ down 150 with a number of tech names uh, dragging down uh, uh, the, the broader um, market today, including Oracle and then Apple. Uh, taking a look at the VIX, the fear gauge, seeing where that is right now, uh, up uh, about 3% there, 3.6% 3 at 143 a historic day in a Washington, D.C. courtroom as the Justice Department's antitrust trial against Google gets underway. The DOJ accusing Google of illegally stifling competition in the world of online search. The government arguing in opening statements that Google has abused its monopoly on search for the past 12 years and that it knew it was crossing antitrust lines. Joining us now is Keith Thilton, professor of law at Boston University, to talk us more through this. Um, so, Keith, how should we think about the government's case here? We have seen this uh, Justice Department, as well as the FTC, really take a more sort of adver adversarial stance against big tech. I guess we're just wondering at this point how solid the government's case might be. I think that all depends on what they're able to prove in, in court. Um, at this stage, the allegations are, are fairly general. Um, I'm not aware of uh, any big surprises uh, so far in the uh, statements that have come out of the DOJ so far. Um, so I think I think everything depends on, on the details. Um, this is certainly getting a lot of attention, given that it's it's the largest antitrust case uh, we have seen in the tech space since. Uh, the government's case against Microsoft. Uh, we've heard a lot of comparisons between those two. And I wonder if you think that's a fair comparison. To, to what extent does the government's case against Microsoft provide a template in this particular one? Well, it, it provides a pretty good template. Uh, in, in many cases, in many ways, the cases are, are quite similar. Uh, Microsoft, uh, the case against Microsoft involved um, a lot of defaults that made Microsoft's property um, sort of the first thing that consumers saw. Uh, Microsoft's uh, operating system, the uh, desktop, Microsoft's browser at the time, Internet Explorer, um, those things were sort of default options that were given to consumers. And that was a big part of the DOJ's case against Microsoft. Um, and so in the same sense, the Google case, the search dominance case involves a, a lot of arguments that, that Google has, by making its search engine, engine the default option, foreclosed other competitors from being able to, um, you know, take over in that area. So in that sense, these cases are a lot alike. Um, and, and in fact, you know, if that were all to it, you know, you could say, well, well the Google faces you know, some serious concerns given what happened in the Microsoft case. Um, on the other hand, I think the law has changed in some significant ways since the Microsoft case. And, and I think the law may have changed in, in ways that uh, will be to Google's benefit. So what exactly, Keith, does the government have to prove here, given some of those changes in law, in order for the DOJ to prevail? Well, this is a monopolization case. 
a Section 2 monopolization case, Section 2 of the Sherman Act, Sherman Act, which means that Google has taken steps that are considered exclusionary and unreasonably exclusionary to avoid having to deal with competitors. Uh, and some of those acts involve its contracts, for example, its contract with Apple, making the Google browser the default search engine. Um, so the government will have to show that those those actions were, were again, I, said, I use the term unreasonably exclusionary. They excluded rivals uh, in a way that can't be explained by uh, legitimate uh, competition. Um, and so that that's going to be the, the you know the, the the difficulty, the charge in front of the DOJ. Now, the you, I think you did ask how has the law changed. Well, one of the major ways in which the law has changed since the Microsoft decision is that the Supreme Court had a, a decision later came out uh, later that came out uh, called Trinko, T R I N K O, uh, Verizon versus Trinko, in which the court said that a firm with a dominant position does not have a duty to accommodate a rival, doesn't have a duty to take steps to make it easier for a rival firm to compete against it. And so I think, I mean, if I were Google, I think I would certainly be asserting that that case is a major part of my defense, uh, since that case wasn't available to Google at the time of the Microsoft decision. How does that play to, to Google's defense, though? I mean, it, you know, it, 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 I'm oversimplifying here, but Google's argument has been, look, our product is just better. It, it, we're, right. We don't have the dominance in the market necessarily because we have a default browser. It, it's that we have right. a better product. And, of course, the government's argument has been, well, you're able to have a better product because you're dominant in all the data that you collect that makes the search that much right. better. So when you talk about that new law in place, how does that play to Google's defense or how does it add to it? Yeah. Well, certainly the arguments that you raised already are, are just those are bread and butter defenses for any large firm in a monopolization case. I mean, Microsoft made the same arguments too. Microsoft argued our products are better. That's why we're dominant. Um, and I think the, the major way in which the Supreme Court's uh, change in its treatment of these monopolization cases, and it's a slight change, but it's still a change that goes in the direction of favoring Google is one that allows Google to say, um, look, you know, to the extent that the argument is that we had a duty to back off from dominating markets, to sort of go slow in dominating markets, uh, if that's part of the charge, uh, no, we don't think we had a duty to back off. We, we could be aggressive, you know, we could seek uh, exclusive deals, we could seek to be the only search engine on the Apple ecosystem because we didn't have to look out and try to make room for competitors to, to uh, you know, have some space to compete against us. Uh, so I think that's one way in which Google, if I were them, I, I would try to use the law, at least the recent change in the law, to put me in a stronger position than Microsoft was in at the time of its litigation against the DOJ. But again, I think the arguments will be very much the same kind of arguments. We have a better product. That's why why we're dominant. Um, I just think there's been a slight change in the law that will give Google a few more weapons uh, to use against the DOJ than Microsoft had. Um, and Keith, no matter the outcome of this case, you know we have seen companies, particularly tech companies, um, when they come up against some regulatory or judicial pressure, they still make tweaks to their business. So do you think in this case that even if the government does not prevail, we could still see it affect sort of the way that, that Google operates? Oh, for sure. I mean, there's, um, you know, co corporations are changing their businesses all the time in response to litigation. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I expect, I suspect that Google is making slight changes here and there already because you know they've got other lawsuits against them too. They not in addition to the the um, search dominance case that we're talking about now. There's also this so-called ad tech monopolization case against Google. So I think Google is facing litigation on a lot of different fronts, and I'm sure they are changing their practices. To try to forestall litigation 
to strengthen their position in court. I think that's I think you know dominant firms do all the, do all that do that all the time in response to litigation. No question. Google's rivals also watching this one very closely, uh, given some of the cases against them. A Boston University professor of law, Keith Hilton, it's good to talk to you today. Appreciate the insight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, oil prices jumping to their highest level this year. Jared Blickery is here with a closer look. Hey there. Well, let's take a look at crude oil, what it's doing over the last three months. In fact, all the uh, all the tickers here on the top line here representing commodities are up more than 15 percent. That begins with heating oil. But we want to talk about crude oil today. Here's what it's done up 32 percent. And you might say, is it done? Is it has it gone too far too fast? And I say the answer is no, because this is a look at what's happened over the last year. We just broke above a resistance level, but basically we've been trading sideways. Should we break above $90? Let me show you what could be in store. We could be heading to these highs around $120 per barrel. By the way, yesterday, JP Morgan uh, CEO Jamie Dimon was saying we could see $120, $130 uh, crude oil, probably talking Brent, but WTI would be close behind here. What could be the catalyst? Well, we also have from the Biden administration, they are rebuilding the SPR. That is a strategic petroleum reserve. They just started that um, relatively recently recently around here and uh, decidedly not down by those $66 per barrel prices. So this is just going to be another marginal consumer of crude oil, which could raise prices. And all of this is against the backdrop of slightly rising energy prices. So far, RBOB, RBOB gasoline futures here, those have been trading sideways over the last three months, arguably the last three, uh, the last year as well. And if we go to a two-year chart, you can see the resistance level. You start chopping above $3 per uh, $3 per whatever there per unit, you're probably going to see to at least four dollars and we could even get far beyond that. Here's a five year look at what's happening. So with next year being an election year, our Bob gasoline futures ticking up. Also, we have CPI tomorrow. I think some of this latest energy data is going to be included in there. That's why we're seeing a, C, uh, a, a handle of 3.6 percent on that uh, headline CPI print. If all that comes to pass, this just shows that goods inflation, the price of commodities, is finally affecting that place of the market where the Fed hasn't been concentrated because the Fed has been concentrated on the services side. It's great that rent inflation is coming down. But if we see energy prices ticking up and if we see crude, uh, crude oil shoot above $90 a barrel, if we see RBOB gasoline futures go to $3, we're going to have a mini crisis on our hands again. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Mini. It's all relative. It's all relative, I guess. I don't know. This rate of inflation still has slowed way down. But if it reaccelerates, that yeah, I, Q1 be next great. year. All right, we'll keep an eye on it. Thanks so much, you Jared. Bet. Appreciate it. Coming up, investors waiting on tomorrow's CPI report, and we're looking at how it could affect the Fed at next week's meeting. We're going to discuss on the other side.
Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with our assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph, so I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion, which is our answer to how generative AI is going to be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you want to be able to respond to that. There are things like Meeting Summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's inside lost. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well. Well, shares of Apple are trading lower after the introduction of the next generation iPhone and Apple watches. That stock down more than 2% right now. The tech giant trying to turn around three consecutive quarters of declining sales with new and improved smartphones. Yahoo Finance's very own Dan Halley is over at Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California. Uh, Dan, you've had a chance to try out some of these devices. What's the big takeaway? I'm sorry, Chico. I'm here in the, the Steve Jobs theater. You can see other uh, journalists and analysts here milling about. Uh, I did get to see the new iPhones as well as the new Apple Watches. Obviously, the big to do is the USB C uh, port that's going to be on all new iPhones uh, going forward, the 15 and 15 Pro. Uh, I think, though, what you'll notice the most, uh, or what Apple was pushing the most, was really how much more the Pros are differentiated from the base iPhone 15. They had everything uh, from better cameras, they had the 5X optical zoom on the highest end uh, iPhone Pro Max. Uh, they also had a A17 Pro chip in them. Uh, beyond that, they're now made with a titanium casing, uh, and they talked up uh, a good deal about how gaming is better on the Pros than the standard 15. Now, they didn't say the 15s you know, were sluggish or anything along those lines. In fact, those get the pro uh, the, the chip that was found in last year's pro devices. So we're talking about the A16 Bionic chip is going to be in the 15 and 15 plus. But really, they focused in on the differentiation between the pro lines, and part of that is obviously to boost average selling price, uh, but also to get people to want to upscale to the now more expensive Pro Max. That's going to start at 11.99. Uh, previously, it started at 10.99. So. Higher starting price on the very, very high end for the iPhones. Uh, for the Apple Watch, we saw uh, a few minor improvements, mostly in the, the display brightness. Uh, now they have a 3,000-nit display on the Apple Watch Ultra uh, 2. 
uh, and a 2000 nit brightness on the Apple Watch Series 9. That basically means you're going to be able, uh, you'll be able to read it easier in direct sunlight, harsh lighting, things along those lines. There's also one very cool feature that I got to try out with the watch line, and that's now a, a feature called Double Tap. So I have the Series 8 on, so it doesn't uh, obviously do this, but you'd be able to lift up your, your wrist or, you know, turn it to wake the watch and then double tap your fingers like that. Uh, and you would be able to do things like, uh, say, start up a, an app, close a timer, answer a call, hang up on a call. Uh, anything that you can really think of that uh, different apps might use for a main interaction, you can do that now with one hand. Apple says that's basically, you know, if you have one hand already taken and you can't just tap your, your wrist, that's what the, the feature is for. I've been there. I've had, you know, my timer continuing to ring, ring, ring uh, as I'm pulling something out of the oven. So it'd be nice to be able to just double tap and get that over with uh, real quick. But it's an interesting feature. The other thing I want to point out uh, is the new uh, uh, action button on the Pro and Pro Max. This is where you used to have that little slider on the side of your phone or you still have the little slider on your side of the phone that puts it into silent mode uh, or allows it to ring. I'm pretty sure everybody has their phones in silent mode now, but whatever. Uh, I think Apple realized that. And so now that's uh, a new action button that's customizable. So you can do things like uh, continue to allow it to uh, silence your phone, uh, put it on mute, uh, put on the flashlight, the camera, uh, accessibility features, the magnifier, uh, and go to uh, different app shortcuts. So it's a cool way to kind of customize it. And again, differentiate those pro line models from the base models. And you know, this has been something that Apple's been building to over time. Last year, they gave the pro models a higher end chip than the uh, prior uh, year and then the uh, base 14s. So they're continuing this kind of evolution uh, of the, the smartphone. Now, whether that means that it'll help pull Apple out of the uh, uh, declines that we've seen as far as uh, sales of iPhones, you know, uh, that remains to be seen. I think it's going to basically just be a, a market-wide reaction rather than just an Apple reaction. Although, as we pointed out, and as, as IDC is uh, released in their own studies, uh, Apple is doing better than the rest of the market because of those uh, high-end trade-in values as well as the buy now, pay later uh, schemes that they have set up. So uh, they continue to do well compared to their competitors. Okay, well, we'll be watching to see if these devices announced today are enough to get users to upgrade their phones, their iPhones at least. Dan Halley, thanks so much for that. Well, let's get a check of stocks today as investors are counting down to Wednesday's key inflation data report. The Dow's been bouncing between gains and losses, but overall the tenor a little more negative here. Joining us to discuss what to expect from CPI and how it might affect the Fed at next week's FOMC meeting is Megan Horneman, Verdant's Capital Advisors Chief Investment Officer. Megan, good to see you. Um, as we look at this inflation outlook here, one of the things that our Jared Blickery was talking about earlier is the input of oil and higher oil prices and how maybe that's going to feed through to inflation. Could we be in for maybe some unpleasant surprises, if not at tomorrow's report, maybe next month's? Yeah, I do think that this is going to continue for the next couple of months. It's, it, energy can be very volatile in the CPI report, but it's not just energy. I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at some of the other economic data that we've gotten out over the past couple of weeks, starting with the NFIB survey yesterday where um, selling prices or their their um, plans to increase selling prices, that rose after eight consecutive months of declines. If you look at the ISM services index, those prices paid also rose. These are things that we think is something the Fed's not going to like. Um, we can't pinpoint exactly when it'll start to filter into CPI data, but we do know that energy can have quite a bit of volatility. We think it's going to start tomorrow, and I think we'll continue with that over the next couple months. Yeah, so, you know, that was that that has been the question. I mean, how big of a risk do you think energy prices pose to reacceleration of inflation? You know, that's always been kind of choppy. But is there a concern that these rising prices, at least this most recent cycle, could be a little stickier? I think, again, people will look past, if you get a tame core number tomorrow and you get a, a headline number that kind of comes in line with consensus, which is already expecting it, I don't know that the market's going to move significantly on that. And I don't think that energy has is going to have such an immediate impact. This is something that all of these things combined together could create an increase in the core inflation in the next couple of months. And that's what the Fed's going to pay a lot of attention to. And so then what do you do as an investor here, right? Do you think that we are going to continue to see 
um, bond yields either at these levels or even higher, which has seemed to be a little bit of an obstacle for this uh, continued rally in tech stocks, for example. Yeah, I do think that what investors have to realize is whether or not the Fed goes, they stay on pause in September next week, which we do think is the case. Um, but we do think that there's much more likelihood of another rate increase, increase at some point this year. And we don't think rate cuts are anywhere on the horizon. So when it comes to tech stocks, as you mentioned, and they're being impacted by higher yields, they have to understand that yields are going to be higher for longer and may even go higher from here. We think valuations aren't pricing that in. And that does still concern us from investing in these heavy tech stocks. You can see some of the news that we've gotten over the past couple of weeks when it comes to technology, whether it's earnings or product releases. Um, these, these stocks are priced in for, 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 for perfection. Um, any negative news, we see a lot of volatility in these stocks. So we still would be cautious there. Uh, we're looking at another potential for a government shutdown if, in fact, you know, we don't see this October 1st deadline come through. Congress doesn't approve proposed spending bills in time for that. Um, how big of a market event would that be? We've seen this happen quite a bit, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know it, it will have long lasting ramifications in the market, but it is something that will just be something, another thing that tests sentiment. Um, there's, there's a lot of negative things that are just looming out there. I know that there's a lot of talk about how strong the economy is, but let's not forget, we haven't absorbed the, the Fed tightening cycle fully yet. Um, the banks, they've been out in the news a lot more lately about the tight, not only do they have tight lending conditions because of what happened in the first quarter of this year, but now they're having additional regulatory um, scrutiny as well. These are things as well as just the strain on the consumer with the increase in interest rates, um, credit cards, the reliance on credit card debt. All of this stuff will eventually come to, fr to fruition and the economy is not going to be able to sustain these levels of growth that we've seen. Do you think that stocks are properly discounting all of that, all of those factors you talked about? I mean, we have seen a little bit of a pullback here, but is it enough of one? No, I don't think so at all. And I think the one thing you'll start to see is that those 2024 earnings estimates are too high. Um, we haven't really seen them come down enough, given our expectation that the economy is in for a tough road ahead in the, the remainder of this year, as well as especially the first half of next year. Uh, finally, before we let you go, I have to ask you about where you're positioning right now. I mean, where do you think... Um, what are some sectors you think are being overlooked right now where you think investors can find particular value? Um, right now, we would be defensive. So stick with some of those the defensive sectors, especially over whether it's consumer discretionary or technology. Um, we still like cash, having a, a overweight cash position, being ready to put money to work. Um, we think other areas like energy might be getting a little ahead of itself. So we're just we're remaining very cautious, defensive sectors over those um, cyclical and growth type of sectors. Where, where specifically is defensive for you right now? Um, uh, broadly, it's cash. Uh, I know that's Ooh. kind of boring for some, but let's be honest, we're paying five to five and a quarter percent on cash, if not higher. So defensively, that's where we are in cash. Um, staples, I think, are another area over something like discretionary. Your, your generally traditional um, defensive sectors that should be able to withstand the economic downturn. Be very careful of some of those other ones that are, that are way too dependent on the consumer, way too interest rate sensitive, um, and stick with those kind of boring old traditional defensive sectors. Megan Hordman, Verdant's Capital Advisors, Chief Investment Officer. At Good takeaways there. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, coming up, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy endorsing an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. What it means for the threat of a government shutdown. That's coming up on the other side.
I am here with Josh Lipton. He is our new anchor, and he's here with three things that you need to know. First of all, tell us how you got into the reporting game. Because of Aunt Rhoda. She was a, just a battle-tested veteran news executive. I used to always have the cigarette in one hand, the, the glass of Jack Daniels in the other. <laughs> Very old school. And after college, I was kind of bouncing around, and Aunt Rhoda said, I think you should try journalism. And that was it. And you listen to Aunt Rhoda. I always listen to Rhoda. What is, has been the favorite story in finance that you've covered? Probably covering Apple. You know, I first got out to San Francisco. I'd never covered tech before. And then CEO Tim Cook said, you know, let's talk about earnings. It was a big deal, and it was just fun to talk to Cook. I think he actually genuinely enjoys himself, which as we both know, not every CEO yeah. always does. NFL season yeah. kicked off. Do you have a team? I am, as you know, Julie, I'm Bay Area born right. and raised. So 49ers, and I look forward to the Niners beating the Eagles and upsetting Brad Smith. I think that'll be a really nice entry into Yahoo Finance. Do you have a favorite food? As you know, I'm married to a proud Italian-American, so it's Italian in my house. That's really not up to me. What's your like knowledge gap that you're sort of self-conscious about? You know, I appreciate cars tremendously, right? But if you ask me what I'm embarrassed about, I should know more about how cars actually work and be able to repair them. That is a knowledge gap, Julie, I'm a little embarrassed about. Are you a fix-it person generally? Like no, I'm terrible. House? I can barely work a <laughs> microwave. I'm awful. <laughs>Now, Speaker Kevin McCarthy announcing today he's ordering House Republicans to move forward with an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here with the details. And, and Rick, the backdrop to all this is, of course, the Speaker himself um, facing a bit of pressure from his own party. Right. So ordinary people uh, can rightly ask, impeach Biden for what? Uh, and Republicans aren't really sure what they're impeaching or they're trying to impeach Biden for. So they say they want to be, do an impeachment inquiry to look into possible corruption. Now, this all relates to uh, President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, uh, who is entangled in some legal difficulties on account of money he got paid by foreign uh, companies in China and in Ukraine that he did not pay taxes on. Um, so it's just the tax payments that are really the question. Uh, Republicans have trying to have been trying to link Joe Biden to some kind of misdeeds uh, ever since uh, Hunter Biden's involvement in Ukraine and China surfaced back during President Trump's uh, presidency. Remember, President Trump got impeached the first time because he was trying to shake down the leader of Ukraine to find dirt on Biden. Guess what? Uh, Trump didn't find any dirt on Biden. Nobody has found any dirt on Biden since. So Republicans are hoping that by opening this inquiry, maybe they will turn up something. But so far, there's nothing there. Um, so what is there to gain? Is it just a reason for, I mean, this the answer to the, a lot of this in Washington, is it just an opportunity to grandstand? Or is there actually something here more concrete that the, this faction of Republicans hopes to accomplish? Well, even even a lot of Republicans are asking that question. I mean, Republicans in the Senate are basically saying this is stupid, this is pointless, and it might backfire. And even some Republicans in the House. I mean, this is driven being driven by the most extreme Republicans in the House, and it doesn't mean it's actually going to get to an impeachment inquiry. This is the beginning of an impeachment inquiry. It might not get that far. But I think there are a couple of reasons, Julie. Number one, just keep this, just keep the idea that Biden might be corrupt in the slipstream, if you will. So. Just hope that if the news keeps reporting and saying the words Biden corruption over and over and over, that maybe more and more voters will think, oh, maybe there must be something corrupt about Biden. And some voters already think that, even though they have not sorted through all the facts regarding Hunter and his father and what the differences are. Uh, let's also remember that the never ending inquiry into Hillary, Min Hillary Clinton's private server did turn up a few morsels that. Um, helped uh, Donald Trump, the Republican candidate, in the 2016 election. Of course, he beat Hillary Clinton. So maybe this inquiry will turn up a little something that they can throw at Biden that might stick in 2024. Um, but, you know, it's as far as they want, they just want people to have in mind that maybe Biden is corrupt somehow. Rick, I don't look forward to the next year. Uh, I do. We're going to have a lot of fun, guys. Look. <clears throat> the presidential election is still more than a year away. 
Donald Trump, though, who is currently the front runner within the GOP race, um, already kind of shaping his policy. What do we know? Yeah, so this caught my attention right away. Trump, obviously, Trump is entangled in four criminal trials involving 91 charges, but he's also uh, trying to develop some, I guess, what maybe some people would say fresh economic policies, but they're kind of retreads. And, and the one that is out there just now is he wants to uh, put tariffs, a, te a new 10% tariff on every import to the United States. So this would go further than what he did when he was actually president, which is he did the steel and aluminum tariffs. And he did um, tariffs on about half of all Chinese imports to the United States. And those policies were outright failures. They did not accomplish what Trump said he wanted to accomplish, which is reduce the U.S. trade deficit with China and reduce the U.S. trade deficit with the world overall. Both of those uh, have gone up, not down, especially the overall trade deficit. It did not add to manufacturing employment while Trump was in office. That flatlined. Um, and there have been a lot of studies since they've been in effect that say this actually cost U.S. jobs because when you put tariffs on imports, guess what? There are a lot of companies that buy those products, and so their costs go up. Uh, one study found that uh, the Trump tariffs actually killed 245,000 U.S. jobs, mostly manufacturers. So why in the world would Trump want to go do this again? I cannot get inside the guy's head. We, we know he, uh, he considers himself tariff man. Somebody long ago must have convinced Trump's, Trump that tariffs are simply a good thing. And now with the true faith of a crusader, he's going to put more tariffs in if he gets the chance. This would also raise uh, a lot of revenue uh, that Trump could use to actually cut other taxes, uh, such as the, bit, the corporate tax rate, which he wants to cut even further. So the trick there is any tax that raises a lot of revenue is a tax on Americans. So this gives... Uh, Republicans running against Trump in the primaries and then President Biden, if we end up with a Trump-Biden uh, rematch, they can say, look, Trump wants to raise your taxes by $250 billion a year, and that will be generally true. So um, I'm perplexed by why Trump would go back to this instead of, not, instead of coming up with something different and better, but here we are. And I have a feeling you've got a number of columns in the works, Rick. Already out. all of this. <laughs> we look Already forward there. to seeing those. <laughs> As always, Rick Newman, thanks so much for that. Hi, guys. Well, coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're going to check in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. Well, there's the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the market, sponsored 
by Tasty Trade. We had a downdraft for all three major averages, but particularly the NASDAQ today. It fell by 1%, let, dragged down by some tech underperformers like Oracle, which reported after the close yesterday, as well as Adobe. The S&P 500 off by a little more than a half of 1%, also hurt by some of those tech movers. The Dow, though, little change, just down 16 points on the day, Akiko. Well, Julie, we are looking at some of the movers or the top movers of the day, and we're watching regional banks following updates from the Barclays Global Financial Services Conference. Zions Bank Corp seeing its best day since July as the company reported higher net interest income in July and August. But it wasn't all good news. Northern Trust underselling pressure as it warned of a bigger than expected decline in net interest income. Uh, Julie, you know, the backdrop to all of this is we're talking about these particular banks today, but it really is about a cloud that's been hanging over regional banks overall. You look at where the Spider S&P regional banking ETF has performed. It's down 25 percent year to date. And, and there's still a lot of questions, especially around sort of commercial real estate, you know, there was that big headline coming out of the journal a few days ago about the doom loop that could potentially happen, the exposure that some of these regional banks have in that area, you know, how, whether that could create a domino effect. Of course, all of this stemming from the concerns that happened earlier this year with SVB and the collapse there. Yeah, the, the conversation seems to have shifted to some extent from deposits, which was really centered on what happened um, with SVB and the others, and was there a big hit to deposits in the wake of that, and sort of more focused on what is on the balance sheet, which is also goes back to SVB, right? Are there uh, big unrealized losses for some of these banks related to commercial real estate, related to other holdings that they have, related even to things like treasuries, uh, which was something that was a vulnerability for that bank as well? And and then sort of related to that, as we see interest rates rise, a lot of the commentary coming out of Barclays today in that conference had to do with net interest income, which, of course, is very closely linked to what is happening with interest rates. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at where those two names perform today, I mean, this is just kind of one headline coming out of that. But um, regional banks certainly going to be in focus um, moving forward as well. And, of course, there's the regulation talk around that, too. Right. Definitely. And shares of energy giant BP closing the day down about 1.4 percent. News that the chief executive, Bernard Looney, has resigned after less than four years on the job. He took over as CEO of BP in 2020 after previously leading the company's upstream group. He had been with BP his entire career, in fact. And BP coming out in a statement here um, and saying that his resignation uh, after his resignation, Murray Alshenklaas, the company's CFO, will be CEO on an interim um, basis. Uh, it looks like that this has to do with conduct, according to the company, in their words, conduct in respect of personal relationships with company colleagues. Um, apparently, Looney had disclosed some relationships in the past before he became CEO, but the company found his disclosure to be lacking. So it seems as though this is what led to the stepping down. But this is really notable. Uh, both of us were talking about this with surprise because he has really tried to push BP into the future in a way that has been different from many of the other oil majors. Yeah, a lot of questions that are going to be raised here. You know, you put the personal conduct aside, which, according to BP, is a reason he's resigning. But in terms of the direction of the company, BP has been a company in transition, uh, one of the most aggressive in terms of their transition to green, cleaner energy uh, when you compare it against some of the other oil giants. I was just looking through some of the numbers again because, you know, it's worth noting some of the aggressive targets they set out, reducing fossil fuel production by 25 percent from 2019 levels by 2030. Uh, Bernard Looney did cut back on that because, uh, you know, he talked about not being able to, to, to bring in the revenue um, under more aggressive aggressive targets that, that talked about fossil fuel production cut of 40 percent. But really, BP, in, in, as much of an example as it can be in this space, has been. So um, there's going to be a lot of questions among investors about whether, you know, what that new leadership looks like and whether that direction continues under new leadership. Well, shares of Casey's General Stores closing the day in the green after the convenience store chain's fiscal first quarter 2024 beat expectations. Demand for pizzas helped drive sales at Casey's General Stores, and its shares hit a record high Tuesday, 
profit was up 11 percent from the year ago. The CEO, Julie, saying the company benefited from what he described as a more normalized macro operating environment that put Casey's business model on full display, but full disclosure. I have never been to a Casey's. Me neither. I was going to ask you. That was going to be my prime question to you. I also <laughs> never been to a Casey's. Apparently, Casey's is known for its pizza. Um, and that was one of the things that drove its same store sales. They launched Thin Crust Pizza, which also did well for them. So that was one of the things that drove the sales <laughs> also. Um, really, uh, you know, interesting here to learn about a company that's not necessarily always on our radar. But, you know, with that 11 percent gain, it gets your attention. One of these days, we'll all make a trip to try the Thin Crust. Did you say the Thin Crust Pizza? Yeah, that's the new one. That's the new offering, apparently. OK. OK, so, well, I'll have to try it. It's on the list. And if you've been to a Casey's, maybe you can let us know. Please. <laughs> Do a taste test there. <laughs> All right, let's move on here with SEC Chair Gary Gensler testifying on oversight of his agency before the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee this afternoon. Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger is following the story and joins us now with the details. Jen. Hey, Akiko, that's right. SEC Chair Gary Gensler on the hot seat this morning before the Senate Banking Committee. Republicans taking him to task over their objections to the, what they say has been a breakneck pace of rulemaking. Among the question topics, crypto. Following a D.C. appeals court ruling that the SEC was wrong to reject Grayscale's proposed Bitcoin ETF, Gensler was asked, what does the SEC need to see to approve a spot Bitcoin ETF? Gensler saying simply, quote, we're still reviewing that decision. We have multiple filings around Bitcoin and exchange sort of products. So it's not just that one you mentioned, but it's multiple others who are reviewing them. And I'm looking forward to staff's recommendations. Coinbase Chief Legal Officer Paul Graywall responding to that in an interview with me saying that Chair Gensler punted on the issue, telling me, quote, there's nothing further to analyze. The SEC needs to go back and do its homework, apply its standards in a neutral way. That was the clear message of that decision. The SEC needs to start taking these court decisions to heart. Now, during the hearing, Gensler reiterated that the crypto industry is rife with misconduct, noncompliance, and fraud. He says in the 44 years that he's been around capital markets, he has never seen anything to this level as crypto, calling it, quote, daunting. Now, separately, Gensler was also pressed on those proposed climate disclosure rules, Gensler saying that the agency is not a climate regulator and has no climate agenda. Akiko? All right, Jennifer Schomberger there uh, with the very latest out of the SEC. Well, coming up, more on the battle between Google and the Department of Justice. That's coming up when Yahoo Finance returns. We'll be right back.
After months of negotiations, UPS and the Teamsters Union reached a five-year labor deal back in July. Now we have a sense of the financial implications of that agreement. Brian Newman, Chief Financial Officer for UPS, joined Yahoo Finance this morning to tell us more about what this new contract means. Look, we're, we're actually very pleased with the contract. Uh, now that it's been fully ratified, uh, we can come out and talk about it, uh, which, which we wanted to do for some time. It's a five-year agreement. Uh, the total uh, cost growth or inflation will be 3.3%. Uh, we're actually giving back things we were already investing in, like uh, vehicles, AC, heat uh, for uh, heat reduction uh, through some hydration programs, et cetera. So we're investing in our facilities, we're investing in our people, but we actually think, Brad and Julie, that having the best workforce in the industry will deliver that service that we're known for, and ultimately that delivers for our customers. And so at a 3.3% uh, inflation rate over the next five years, you just benchmark that versus a four plus percent uh, five-year treasury, that's a pretty good rate. Um, so give us a little more color about how that money is going to be spent and at what cadence, because uh, you all have described this as sort of a barbell, right? With 46% of the cost coming in the first year, what's the other end of that barbell in the last year then? And, and how is, it, is that paid out in the form of bonuses? What is that going to look like? So, so the, the barbell is a good uh, optical piece. Uh, I think, Julie, the tough part is the front end of the barbell. I'm less worried about the back end of the barbell. I'll tell you why in a minute. But the front end over the next 12 months, having nearly half, 46% of the inflation hit in that part, what it does is it sets you up for years two, three, and four. That's a number that 3.3%, that's a gross number. Does not include pricing, does not include productivity. So it gives us the ability to drive pricing and productivity to expand margins, throw off cash, et cetera. By year five, there's another uh, step up. But the, the reason I'm not as worried about that is we have uh, we've basically maintained the technology clause in the contract that allows us to, to deploy and leverage technology to become more efficient and drive productivity. So the investments we'll be making over the next three, four years will be really focused on how does UPS become more efficient? And that's in, in technology like RFID, digital capability, et cetera. But that, that basically drives productivity. Perhaps something that investors will be a, a little bit more excited about here is that this kind of locks in or at least gives them a benchmark for what labor costs will look like for, for the next five years. But uh, something on the other side here for, for drivers, if we consider how this also changes their existing assignments, the scheduling, what does that look like as part of this negotiation and part of the dealing that's uh, uh, essentially come to a, what you described as a win-win agreement? Yeah, it, it really, Brad, it is a win-win agreement. And I was I was in New York with a lot of our employees uh, and drivers a couple of weeks ago as we celebrated Founders Day. I'm out here on the West Coast this morning with, with our employees as well. Uh, the drivers will be making $170,000 at the end of this contract. That's a fan fantastic wage, and it basically locks in that service and, and, and reliability that, that our customers rely on for UPS. So I think we have the best employees. Ultimately, uh, by, by, by giving them the pay they deserve, and, and it's a fair, uh, fair trade, We've also employed flexibility. So our part-timers can now, during the se seasonal uh, holiday, during peak, they can come on as part-time seasonal drivers. And so we're leveraging the best of both worlds. Take the part-timers who know UPS, give them the flexibility to drive uh, as part-time season or full-time seasonal drivers. That's a really positive uh, spin. So flexibility and getting the best labor out there will deliver the service. And, and Brian, just to be clear, that 170,000 is salary and benefits. That's not like the base right. salary. So just to, for for clarity's sake, there. Um, all in, Julie. All of this said, investors are not entirely convinced, I think safe to say, at least if you look at the stock price and how it is done over the course of these negotiations, but not even over the course of negotiations since they have been concluded. And even today, as you gave more details on these costs over the next few years, what are investors missing here? They're seeing these big numbers and maybe a little spooked. Yeah, Julie, I, I think there's a, a, a bit of a hangover. Coming out of the contract negotiation, we were waiting for ra uh, full ratification. Now that we're out there and, and basically have shared the 3.3%, the certainty is great, I think, for investors. So over the long term, the next five years, they know what our biggest input costs will, will grow. I think the challenge becomes uh, in the short term, that 46% of the contract inflation happens in the first 12 months. There's a bit of an overhang short term. And I think investors are waiting to see the volume pull through. We have a $7 billion pipeline of sales out there. And now it's our job since last week 
the contract fully ratified. Now we have to pull those sales through, show them the volume, and we've already uh, proven that we can we can generate uh, a lot of productivity in the business. So I, I, I like the trade uh, going forward. I think the investors are just cautious with the short-term productivity, but I think certainly years two, three, and four, they bode well for the stock. What amount of that $7 billion pipeline do you believe could come through by the holiday season, by or before the holiday season, which is a, a, a peak time we know for logistics operations. Well, it's uh, the cardboard is going on the truck this week, uh, Brad. So, uh, so it's it's happening. Uh, as I said, as a as a benchmark, we would like December of this year to get back to flat versus prior year. We exited the last quarter down 12 percent in the month of June. So that down 12 will 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 transition to flat. Uh, over the course of the back half of the year. So we're very focused on it. But with the sales team, the U.S. operations, they're, they're both winning back and they're pulling through that sales pipeline. Big focus right now. Um, Brian, forgive me for a small detour here, but I want to address some news that came out this morning from one of your competitors, a newer competitor, that is Amazon, that is launching a new supply chain sort of end-to-end -end product for sellers. And again, forgive me, I I'm not sure if it directly competes with something that UPS offers. So what what can you tell us about this and, and the sort of competitive risk here? So uh, Amazon is, is one of our biggest partners and, uh, and we, uh, uh, we have a mutually beneficial uh, agreement or arrangement uh, that, that we're pleased with. At the end of the day, uh, we have a path with, with Amazon from a volume perspective to try and glide the volume down. We've talked about that publicly. Uh, and, and so as we do that, uh, we focus on the packages that make the most sense to be in the UPS system, and Amazon's focused on their volume. We're not Amazon's supply chain in any way, shape, or form. We're a part of their supply chain, which is particularly valuable uh, in, in the peak season when the volume goes up significantly, uh, and also uh, through elements like returns uh, that they leverage UPS for. That was Brian Newman, Chief Financial Officer at UPS. Well, let's do a quick check of the markets sponsored by Tasty Trade. Uh, down day across the board today, uh, although NASDAQ in focus with tech names uh, uh, lower today, that was down about 1%. And after hours, of course, we've been watching shares of Apple trading as investors react to that big launch event over in Cupertino. The Google antitrust case getting underway. The first witness is already on the stand. Google chief economist Hal Varian facing questions over Google's default distribution strategy for its search engine. And it comes as the Justice Department makes its case that Google misused its power in online search to bully the competition. Joining us now is Adam Kov Kovakovich, uh, Chamber of Progress founder and CEO. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for being here. So. Um, as we look at this case and as it gets underway, um, Google, for its part, seems to be arguing that people come to its product that it's the best <laughs> because it's the best. And the Department of Justice seems to be saying, well, uh, but you made it the best because you funneled everybody to come to you through means that you shouldn't have used. How, as an observer of this case, how are, are you sort of weighing the two sides here? Sure. Well, the first part of the case is that the Department of Justice has to prove that Google has a monopoly in what they call general search and search advertising. And Google will contest that, but that's not really the heart of the case. And, and frankly, Google could lose on that point and still go on to win the case. The heart of the case is really about Google's deals with Apple, with Mozilla, and with phone manufacturers to have Google search be the default search on browsers and devices. And I think that, that in some ways, these deals are a little bit like um, grocery, sh grocery store shelving deals, right? So if you walk into Safeway and then you go into the cookie aisle, you see that Oreo has a lot of, um, has a lot of uh, products on the cookie aisle. That's because Oreo, uh, Mondelez, has paid Safeway for that shelf space. But it doesn't preclude uh, Hydrox or Chips Ahoy from also being on that shelf space as well. And in fact, if you look at Apple and Mozilla, they also do deals with other search engines like Bing and DuckDuckGo and Yahoo, not to be the default, but to be among the other choices. And so that I think that's going to come to play as the trial proceeds. Are these are these like promotional deals that we've seen uh, in other spaces like grocery stores? Um, Adam, you know, we should point out that that you did formerly work at Google. And so obviously, you know, you're, you're very well versed in, in the arguments on the Google side. I'm curious how you think away from this case, 
Uh, this is likely to change the way Google does business. You know, we, we were talking earlier today about how things changed for Microsoft. That ended in a settlement, but there was an argument to be made that the, the trial was the remedy, right, from the government side of things. Uh, can you argue that in many ways DOJ in this case can make its point without necessarily winning because of the pressure that will be very publicly displayed on Google? Well, I think the reality is that, you know, 1998, when the Microsoft case was brought involving Netscape was eons ago in terms of technology. And a lot of the issues in that case really had to do with things like how hard it was to switch to a competing web browser um, from Netscape, you know, to, to a competing web browser like Netscape. And it's a much easier to switch to a competing search engine today. So I don't know, I don't think this case has that much to do with where things go in the future, particularly because if you look at the last year, arguably the most significant thing that's happened in terms of search has been uh, generative AI and particularly the rise of ChatGPT. And make no doubt about it, ChatGPT is a competitor to Google. And if ChatGPT is really good, um, it actually gives Google a search, a run for its money. Google knows this, they've responded, they're competing, that's what we wanna see. But I think in some ways, um, the, 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 that competition that's been spurred by ChatGPT undercuts the DOJ's case a little bit because it because ChatGPT didn't have any default search deals and yet it's giving Google a run for its money. And so, and I think that's good. That, that competition leads to more innovation for consumers. I don't think there's any absence of that at all. I think on an anecdotal basis, maybe it's giving it for a run for its money. But if you look at the latest numbers, I don't know that the market share has actually budged that much, which maybe gives credence to the idea that these are entrenched relationships. I, I mean, I have to wonder, Part of the crux mm -hmm. of the DOJ's case, DOJ's case seems to be the financial relationship between uh, Google and those who are carrying its search engine. What if Google stopped paying them? What if there wasn't that financial relationship? What if they just, well, this is what, if indeed, the what if indeed they just that, yeah. rose to the top merely yeah. only on the basis of what search is good and what isn't? Well, it's very interesting because this stage of the case is not about remedies. It's just about the Department of Justice proving its case. But if the Department of Justice wins, there will be a second phase that's about remedies. But but I think your question is a great one because let's say, for example, that they found that Google, it's really, Google shouldn't be paying Apple or Mozilla for these deals, right? So then Apple and Mozilla still want to do those deals, but who's left to do them with? Well, that's Bing, right? And I think you'd see two things happen. One, Bing as the only bidder for those deals would make the price they would pay to Mozilla and Apple actually go down. Interestingly enough, this is how Mozilla earns most of its money. And so I actually think in some ways the biggest potential loser from a DOJ win in this case would be Mozilla more than anyone else. But uh, some significant portion of consumers are still going to choose the highest quality search engine regardless of the default. And I think that were Google not to be the default, all evidence suggests that that a lot of people would switch back to it. In fact, Yahoo had done a deal uh, several years ago on the search side to to replace Google as their default and move, or, uh, or Mozilla had done a, a deal to replace Google with a Yahoo. Yahoo's search didn't monetize as well, didn't perform as well, and Mozilla went back to Google, in part because their users also did, right? So I think that um, do defaults matter? Yes, they clearly matter for something, but are they the driver? No, I think at the end of the day, it's quality of the search engine that's driving consumer preferences. Adam, you're, you're certainly gonna get a lot of users on board who say, look, Google search is just better. But, but the DOJ argument being that it is able to put out a better product because of all the data it can collect, and it has done so through its dominance in the market, right? Through these deals that have been made. So how do you respond to that argument you're absolutely right. And I listened to the opening arguments uh, of the trial this morning. And the art point you just made is at the heart of the Department of Justice's a, a case against Google, essentially that they almost call it a data barrier to entry that Google's deals give them an unbeatable data advantage. I think Google's counter to that point will be sort of two points. One is that Bing, earlier this year, Microsoft claimed, declared publicly that they basically now have, you know, they've made Bing as, as good as it's ever been because of, frankly, massive amounts of data and their partnership with ChatGPT and OpenAI. 
but also Bing powers uh, DuckDuckGo and Yahoo search as well. And so they're getting the benefit of those searches as well. But ultimately, I think Google's argument will be that past a certain point, data has diminishing returns. So there, that scale matters, um, but ultimately it, it's sort of like saying, the, past a certain point, the number of ingredients doesn't matter as much as the quality of recipes. And so I think that's that's going to be essentially a, a, a tug uh, a tug of war in this case over the next eight to 10 weeks when it's being heard in court and ultimately up to the judge to decide kind of where uh, where he sits there. Adam, thanks for your time on this. Adam Kavakovich of the Chamber of Progress is the founder and CEO of that tech industry coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we're going around the horn and checking in on some of today's top trending stories, including Apple's latest launch and WWE ringing in a new era. Stick around, more Yahoo Finance on the other side. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Alexandra Canal, joined by Julie Hyman, Josh Lipton. We have a few stories, but Josh, I want to start with you because I know you're keeping your eye on Apple on the heels of that big event earlier yeah, today. Yeah, so a big show, I think after that show, there's a couple themes that are already being discussed. One is pricing, right? So most pricing was kept the same. That was a surprise to some folks. I mean, some, in, and there was this kind of debate going on where some investors, I think, were hoping you were gonna raise prices really across the board. Others were saying, well, maybe against this backdrop, we had this slowing smartphone market. We all know some headwinds that consumers were feeling. They weren't, they weren't so, so fans of that. So it'll be interesting how that kind of plays out. Um, the other one is to talk about the install base. You know, at these, at these events, you talk about all the bells and whistles and the features, but it really often come back to, all right, how many people 
who are tuning in that are Apple fans right now who think, you know what, I'm ready for an upgrade. I'm Julie Hyman, I'm on the iPhone 11, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking, you know what, mm -hmm. it's time to make a move, and there's a lot of debate about that on the street. Hit me. I indeed am Julie Hyman, and I have an iPhone 11. Um, I feel okay. like I feel like it's like a, a you know admission. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I need a new phone or not. I, I'm you know. surprised because I got a new phone in the spring, and I really should have held out. Mm. But my battery wasn't charging; it wasn't holding a charge. Of the long new enough. phone? It was the XR, I think I had. So the new phone, obviously, the battery is great. But I wanted, I really needed to get the upgrade because I, it wasn't holding a charge. I was going out my phone was dying constantly and I think that's one of the things Apple tries to do to get you to buy a new phone. Well, the, I think the debate, it's going to be interesting because some, some analysts are going to say, listen, the features, even modest improvements could get people to make a move, right? In other words, there's some analysts, they crunch the numbers, they say, okay, 25%, that's their estimate of, let's say, roughly 1 billion iPhones that are out there, people haven't upgraded in four years. And so that's their bet, right? Their bet is that's enough well, to get people to go. Others are, are much more skeptical and say, listen, people are just keeping their phones for longer. I you mean, can't bet on that's that. That's the question. Like, And there's always been these conspiracy theories about how long Apple designs the phones to actually last before they stop working mm -hmm. and you have to get a new one, to your point mm -hmm. about your battery life. Obviously, we don't know if that's true right. or not, but that is the question, right? Do you get a new phone because yours just doesn't work anymore? Or do you get a new phone because you're so attracted by whatever it is they came out with today? It doesn't feel to me like the upgrades that were announced today are so compelling exactly. that it's a no-brainer that people are going to just rush out and get the new phone, regardless of whether the old yeah, phone Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it's a bet you're making. If you're moving to Apple, it's because you are bullish on that upgrade cycle. You think, you know what, Tim Cook took the stage today, and with the faster processor and the titanium casing, the better camera, I know camera we talk about a lot, but honestly, yeah. it really is a reason people make the move. Was that enough to kickstart something and really real accelerate growth? You're looking for that December quarter. That's the big holiday quarter where you want to see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing with the casing, you put a case on the thing anyway, at least if you uh, do you not have a case on your phone, oh, Josh Lipton? Oh my that's gosh, how, I have a case how, and my what? phone is still cracked that's because how I, I roll, drop Julie. it. That's how I roll, Julie. You know that's how I roll. I take the risks. Wow, okay. that's, and you that is a, risky. And you have a preschooler? You like yeah. living life Who on the edge. Who loves this phone, by the way. You can't keep Ooh, it out of her hands. I don't know, I know how that thing is not broken. Um, <laughs> the story I'm watching today, too, we have a new listing that is kind of an old listing, right? And what, really interesting here, it's called TKO Holding, um, as in technical knockout. WWE Love and it. UFC yep. mm -hmm. come in together um, for this new listing. The stock is trading a little bit higher today. You see, they rang the bell. Um, and just so many interesting personalities involved in this because you have yeah. Endeavor, the big talent firm that owns 51% of this. You have Vince McMahon who by the way, came back, right? He was temporarily removed because there had been allegations of sexual impropriety um, and harassment. He stepped down from the company, but then he came back to the company, and so he is still now involved. So there's that kind of, I don't know, somewhat salacious or scandal-ridden issue um, related to it. But then you have the bet that investors are making, that there are a lot of rights here attached to these properties, streaming rights, broadcast rights that are attractive for investors. Yeah, I think this company is debuting at the perfect time. We're at this crossroads in media where we are seeing a lot of cord cutting, where we are seeing consumers opt for streaming services. And you're right, there's that exposure to linear, but not fully exposed right. to linear. So they can utilize this streaming boom that we're seeing across the sector. And on top of that, you're seeing a lot of companies really embrace live sports, right? We have Warner Brothers Discovery teasing a live sports offering. We know Disney is going to take ESPN fully over the top. Another element of stickiness to really drive people to platforms. So again, I think it's just a perfect time for this company to, to really emerge. Yeah, and I think also, you know, people, you know, sometimes you get reminded of how big UFC is. One of the first stories I ever wrote, this is like 20, 25 years ago, and I was like, dude, how old are you? <laughs> um, I went to like a UFC, it was Atlantic City, it was so small that I was actually able, I literally just walked down to the octagon, no credentials, nothing, and just introduced myself to Dana White, the UFC president. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how small it's, and now you fast forward, apparently you're talking about a fan base that's 700 million. I mean, it's a global sport. Yeah, the um, the it was so enticing, I guess. Arothk MKM already initiated coverage of it with a buy rating and talked about the sweet spot of the uh, evolving media eco structure, mm -hmm. if you will, what you're talking about, about sort of 
being able to access these different types of, of opportunities, streaming and broadcast. So, you know, we'll end up seeing what happens. I should mention, you know, I was talking about McMahon. He is the executive chairman, so he's not running this company day to day. But it just, again, interesting kind of the personalities sure. that are yep. involved here. Big personalities and, like you're saying, big changes in media. Also big changes coming to McDonald's. And that mm. is my story today because, you know, the self-service where you go and get a drink. Yeah. Maybe you get a couple refills here and there. That's going to be gone soon. Apparently, that is what does, uh, McDonald's is focusing on. And they say this is due to a few factors, food safety, eliminating theft, and creating a more relaxed dining experience. When we talk about dining in at McDonald's in particular, that has really slowed since yep. the pandemic. And they're really yep. focusing on digital, a drive-through delivery, the, the three Ds as they call it. And this is coming at a time where we're talking about a lot of fast food chains. We were just talking about Popeyes yesterday, how they're trying to revolutionize their business and uh, be more operational and be able to get things done at a quicker rate. So we'll see if this uh, removal of the self-service drinks will do anything. Now you're going to have to go to an employee to get that done. But yeah, and it's sad, I, a little bit. It's the end of an era. <laughs> I'm so naive. I, when I was reading about this, I had no idea that soda theft was a thing. I was not aware that people, that was the thing, that people come in with their own cups. I can see it. I just want to water, a, get a, a little Coke, Coke, yeah. Well, And the thing about it is, like, how much soda has to be stolen in order for it to make a the difference. smallest of dents. Do you yeah. know what the margins on that stuff? It's so true. I mean, yes. they're not, you're, what McDonald's is paying for what comes out of that machine yeah. is nothing. But yeah. to your point, I, I wasn't surprised by it because when the Lipton family hits McDonald's, and we mm. do a lot because the four-year-old, all about the Oreo McFlurry. Oh, love that. Um, but when we, to your point, we hit it all the time. I mean, they should send me a thank you note. That's how many Oreo mm -hmm. McFlurries we get. But when Sid wants that flurry, we hit the drive-through. I'm never in the restaurant. And to your point, that's what's mm. happening. Like, it's drive-through, it's pick up and go. It's the third-party vendor, open an app. You know, it is yeah. a change. Yeah, and I think just to make it more cohesive, uh, I guess, among all the different franchises, potentially, too. I don't remember the last time I've been to McDonald's. You're missing out, Julie. It's, Am I, though? It's, I like I've door it recently, yeah. which I'm not proud of, but. <laughs> I just, I've, I've got no reason to go to a McDonald's. All right, we're going to take Sorry. you and get an Oreo McFlurry. You'll come with, you'll come with Josh and Sid. <laughs> it's going to be a whole afternoon. You're going to love it. I'll go with Josh and Sid. Don't need to. I guess I would get to. I don't know. All right. Group trip it's to fine. get Oreo McFlurries. And we'll be right back on the other side of this break. More Yahoo Finance coming right up. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Cold medicines be gone. A panel of FDA advisors say over-the-counter decongestants may not work and therefore need to be reclassified. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani has the story. And what particular ones are we talking about, Anjali? Well, it's not all nasal decongestants, but those that have the ingredient phenylephrine. And that's a, a, an ingredient in these products that has actually been a, a controversy for quite some time. Dating back to even 2007, the FDA, actually the same advisory group that met today, met then, of course, different members at the time, and discussed the same problem, the ineffectiveness based on some studies of this ingredient in those products. So what we know now is that while they are safe to use, uh, the evidence does not necessarily support the effectiveness or, of it, especially in oral form. So that includes uh, you know, companies like VIX, um, or rather products like VIX, Tylenol, Benadryl, Robitussin, Bayer products, um, even those uh, off-brand uh, ones for CVS and Walgreens, all of those nasal decongestant products that are oral, so pill form, are the ones that really are a part of this effort. Uh, the nasal spray still remains unimpacted by this, as does pseudofedrine, which is the key ingredient in Sudafed. Now, where does this all get confusing is that uh, we did see also pseudofedrine get a little bit of pressure back in around the same time frame in 2006 because of its abuse in use in making meth. And so that was put behind the counter. So what this really does is limits access for patients who need a nasal decongestant around this time of year, winter. And so that's sort of what uh, has really caused the concern around this potential decision. The FDA has been looking at data since around 2007. They approved phenylephrine around the late 1970s at first. Uh, and even then there's some there were some indications that some uh, you know, some studies may not may have shown it to be ineffective, but we have seen that, you know, even globally, because of the concerns, makers around the world have switched from phenylephrine to pseudofedrine. So it really is uh, or rather the other way around in order to avoid, you know, that abuse. And so it really has been a long sort of storied history there, uh, as you can see on your screen, just that timeline of approval through concern really in the last two decades of this uh, uh, product, of this key ingredient. And while, it, uh, again, it isn't dangerous, it just isn't effective. So they could be moving to take a lot of product off the shelf uh, just in time for this winter season. It would be nice if people stop wasting their money on it, though, if it doesn't work. But also, I mean, you would think they would have come up with a better mousetrap by now for to treat the common cold. I know it's a tough one. Anyway, <laughs> Julie, we've got to turn to something else. The CDC has made the final call on COVID booster approval. So what do we need to know? That's right. So the advisory committee uh, just voted a majority in favor of approving those vaccine boosters. That's the one that uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and Novavax have all been updating as a monovalent so that just a single targeting those variants, XBB15 in particular. Now, what this means is that those doses should be available as soon as the CDC director signs off on this, and that will open the door to get those vaccinations done for fall. Now, just a point of note, uh, we, did, we do know that, of course, both Pfizer and Moderna did already get the green light from the FDA. However, Novavax is still waiting on their authorization to go through because ha they haven't yet, uh, there isn't actually a clear reason why they haven't been able to get that. So while we were waiting to get all three out the door, see all three, get their authorization and that green light and basically open the doors, uh, only two so far will be able to do that as soon as the CDC signs off. The way they did vote on it today, though, is to allow once uh, Novavax gets their approval to be able to uh, join in on the market. We also got some interesting insight from the meeting today, which is the list prices of these vaccines. Uh, we, If you recall earlier this year, Pfizer and Moderna uh, gave a range of about 110 to 130. And if you see on your screen, they're falling on kind of the middle upper range of that. Meanwhile, Novavax at 130 per dose. Again, that is the list price. So of course, we know um, in, in the insured won't necessarily have to pay that. And of course, there are rebates and the like uh, that go on with all these contracts. So just a, a little insight into that. Uh, but as of right now, we have potentially three uh, new vaccines to be able to take this winter. 
again once one of them gets greenlit. So that's the news for right now. Yeah, just in time as we see those cases tick up for COVID. Anjali Kamlani, thanks so much for that. We are continuing our week-long special student loans, Smarter Strategies. As 43 million borrowers will have to start repaying those loans in just a few weeks, today we're talking credit scores. Joining us now with a look at what you need to know about your credit score is Tom Aleph, Equifax Risk Advisors leader. So obviously your student debt, your repayment thereof affects your credit score. Um, what do people need to know, first of all, if they haven't been paying student debt for the past few years, has that had an effect on the credit score? Yeah, so there's there's definitely, you know, when we think about, you know, how credit scores are made up, you know, student loans is one component of that credit score. You know, you described the 43 million consumers that are, uh, you know, incorporated within that, uh, you know, position. And the things that are uh, taken into consideration for a credit score are related to their payment history, you know, the, the number of accounts they have, the length of file, and utilization. And so, you know, while those consumers have not had to make those payments, they were able to uh, distribute that, uh, th that payment and money elsewhere. And so there was some, uh, some improvements in some credit scores as a result. Yeah, what kind of improvements did we see over the last three years? I mean, that seems to suggest just how big of a burden student loans are now that the payments have resumed. Yeah, so there's definitely been an impact. Uh, if we go back for the last three years, you know, on average, we've seen, uh, you know, approximately uh, you know, about, you know, 15 points on average for, uh, you know, consumer score increases. And as you move into a more subprime uh, credit status, there was a greater increase of by about 30 points. Now, when we consider what were the drivers behind that, federal stimulus it played a major role in the consumer's ability to pay down delinquencies, pay down their utilization, pay down their balances. And in addition to that, the student loan, uh, you know, payments were, uh, not incorporated as a part of that. So there was an overall uh, net positive consumer cash flow perspective that were that was making that impact. And then things like inflation uh, occurring, you know, can also uh, challenge consumer cash flow as well as things like unemployment. Tom, when Equifax is devising the credit score, does it weight different kinds of debt differently? In other words, um, are, uh, lend, are borrowers dinged more for not repaying, say, student debt versus a mortgage versus credit card debt? How, how does that all get calculated? Yeah, the greatest impact to a credit score is definitely going to be uh, payment history, whether it's uh, paid as agreed or not. And uh, more often than not, it's, it, it's not necessarily uh, a, a more or less impact. It's more the indicator of was a payment missed that was agreed upon. And so, Tom, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of people out there who have seen the resumption of their student loans. You know, they're sort of counting on the forgiveness. That's sort of in question right now. But they can't make the payments, at least as they stand right now. What options do they have? Yeah, so there's there's definitely, you know, positions to be able to understand, like, where, where should they be making those payments? You know, should they consider things such as a uh, consolidation? Um, and you know, and, and find additional ways to obtain uh, obtain cash to be able to to make those payments. Now, of course, those things are a little more challenging to uh, you know to change someone's uh, net income or positive situation as a part of that. But there's there's many different avenues that uh, that consumers can you know look to leverage to be able to incorporate. And how big of a hit do you anticipate moving forward? I mean, again, as we talked about this yesterday, there's still a lot of questions around you know, what the Biden administration is now going for, their plan B, uh, given the Supreme Court decision, how many will actually have their loans, um, you know, canceled. But when you think about where things stand right now and those students who haven't had to make those payments for the last three years, I mean, are we seeing those credit scores get dinged? Are we seeing an escalation? What are you expecting? Yeah, so once those payments resume, you know, there, of course, is going to be a higher monthly payment that will exist. And, you know, depending on the consumer, it could range, you know, $100 to $500 to, to potentially more. And so every consumer is going to have a different impact, uh, you know, according to their own uh, personal situation. And a lot of that's going to be driven by their, uh, by their cash flow. Now, from an immediacy standpoint, there will be some impact. Anytime you uh, have an, a new payment that comes in, it will have some impact. However, delinquencies are being delayed in terms of their reporting. And as I mentioned before, delinquencies are the most uh, impactful components uh, of a consumer's uh, credit profile that impacts their credit score. 
So as as long as those delinquencies are you know have some delay in them, uh, credit scores won't be as impacted. Now they they will have impact according to you know adding this additional payments in. Tom, thanks for walking us through all this. Tom Aliff is risk advisory leader at Equifax. Thanks. Thank you. Coming up, closing time here on Yahoo Finance. We'll recap the top stories of the day and get you set for everything you need to know tomorrow. Stay tuned. It's closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look at some of the top stories of the day. Apple making it official, unveiling its iPhone 15 lineup. One of the biggest changes, a new charger. Apple abandoning the lightning cable and it's switching to USB-C. The iPhone 15 and iPhone 15 Plus, they'll start with a $799 price tag. That's the same as it was a year ago. It also unveiled the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max starting at $999. Another key announcement was the next generation of Apple Watch. And Birkenstock filing for its initial public offering. The footwear company seeking a valuation between $7 and $8 billion. But pricing of the IPO, we'll find that out at a later date. The company will trade on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol BIRK, P-I-R-K. And a major deal in the packaging sector. Ireland's Smurf at Kappa acquiring Westrock, which is based in the U.S., for $11 billion. Together, the companies have a market value of about $20 billion. This will create the world's biggest paper and packaging company at a time when demand is weakening and prices are falling. And here's what to watch on Wednesday. We're going to get the latest read on inflation with consumer price index data set to be released. The report is expected to show headline inflation continuing to reverse its downward trend as oil prices rise. That hit an all time or all year high today. Economists forecast the August numbers will show a rise of 3.6% on a year on year. And the core CPI, the measure that strips out food and energy costs, is expected to rise slightly on that July figure by the same rate as last month, 0.2%. AI will also be in focus as leaders in big tech will join the Senate's first ever AI forum tomorrow. Senator Schumer will lead the discussions that will take place behind closed doors. Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Sundar Pichai and Bill Gates all expected to attend. Musk will also meet with senators tomorrow to discuss Starlink, 
following his choice to block Ukraine from extending the private satellite network for an attack on Russian warships. Senator Elizabeth Warren is demanding an investigation now. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to an absolute closing bell. And I'll be here in the morning for CPI. Keep it right here.